The World to Come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. This is part two, examining what the Bible says about Pentecostalism and speaking in tongues. We've been asking whether this is evidence of the Holy Spirit. This is the belief of millions of Pentecostals. We examine baptism with the Holy Spirit and Terry meetings. Is speaking in tongues the proof one has received God's power? You are learning truth that virtually all Christendom, including Pentecostals, do not understand. There are only two occasions in the New Testament where anyone spoke with tongues upon receiving God's Spirit. We saw in part one that the Acts 2 Pentecost account was a case of people hearing in their own tongue. Let's examine these additional accounts. Acts 10 records the story of God's Spirit being given to Gentiles for the first time, when the Italian Cornelius, with his household, received it. The account concludes, While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. The Apostle Paul also explained how the Holy Spirit was to be given to Gentiles. Notice, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This promise comes through faith. There is nothing here about the promise of the Spirit being fulfilled at a Terry meeting. Also, the blessing has nothing to do with the blessing Pentecostals seek at Terry meetings. It means that converted Gentiles become children of all the blessings and promises made to Abraham because they are actually Abraham's children. Later, in Acts 11, Peter reported to the apostles, with certain naysayers present, what had happened with Cornelius. And as I began to speak, Peter says, the Holy Spirit fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. God gave them the like gift as he did unto us. Peter says nothing of God's Spirit coming with a sudden great sound from heaven that resembled a roaring wind. There is simply no parallel between this and Acts 2. However, the occasion was very important because, as Peter concluded, then has God also to the Gentiles granted, or given, repentance unto life. As with Acts 2, this was another special event in the development of God's church. For the first time, God was converting Gentiles. Also note the reference to granted repentance, which introduces an overlooked but all-important element. We will study this later in detail. Here is the second occasion. Paul came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily or truly baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. Note several things. One, these men did speak with tongues. Two, it occurred after baptism. Three, and after Paul laid hands on them. Four, they knew of repentance from John the Baptist. Five, there is no evidence they tarried or waited to receive God's Spirit. And six, this was a very small group. Almost nothing in this account was similar to the Pentecost occurrence. Though modern Pentecostals may be sincere, they have no hope of repeating what happened in Acts 2. That event had never occurred before and will never happen again in the same way. So many today think in reverse, completely backwards from what God intends. They gather in Terry meetings to plead with God over and over to send His Spirit, to send another Pentecost, as they put it, as in A.D. 31. 
Their repeated beseeching of God for His Spirit suggests God is reluctant to give it. They beg and agonize, believing that only by doing this will God finally, seemingly reluctantly, grant the power of His Spirit. Is this a correct picture? In fact, it reflects the opposite of the way God thinks. He is more than eager to give His Holy Spirit to all who ask Him. Notice, if you then, being evil, speaking of human beings generally, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him, to His children? None need beg, plead, or cajole God to give what He already wants to give. If you are sincere and repentant, God is eager to bestow His Spirit. Also see Revelation 3, 19-20. Here is where many go further astray. From Christ's ascension, the disciples waited ten days for Pentecost. Tragically, many read this and think they must plead and cry over a long period represented by the ten days, until God relents and finally gives His Spirit. Such terrible misunderstanding. Peter's Pentecost sermon included a direct instruction about receiving God's Spirit to anyone who showed genuine remorse and sorrow for how their sins had crucified Christ. If you are of Pentecostal background, this statement is not what you expect. But it is the official apostles' doctrine on the matter. Let's read. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The two and only two preconditions for baptism and receiving God's Spirit are one, repent, and two, believe, have faith. Paul taught everywhere repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. But do not misunderstand. God does not owe you His Spirit because you have repented and exercised faith. His Spirit is a gift, as is repentance. Like salvation, God's Spirit is not something you can earn by works. Read Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. In fact, even the faith to believe is a gift. Same verse. Acts 1 describes Jesus' last instruction to His disciples before ascending to heaven. He promised they would soon receive God's Spirit and told them to wait. Let's see. Jesus, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, says He, you have heard of Me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Key phrase. Pentecost was just ten days later. The disciples knew what Pentecost meant and exactly when this day would come. Leviticus 23 describes seven annual festivals that ancient Israel was to observe each year. This chapter begins by describing Passover and follows with a description of two festivals on the first and last days of the seven-day period known as the Days of Unleavened Bread. These two days are annual Sabbaths, holy days, which picture obedience to God and putting away sin from our lives. Unleavened bread is followed later in the spring by the festival of first fruits or Pentecost, the third annual holy day. This is described in Leviticus 23, verses 9 to 22. Verse 16 there instructs to number 50 days until this festival. Certain verses explain that the church, composed of those led by the Holy Spirit, are God's first fruits. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do on Pentecost. He made sure the disciples understood what he meant by, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. No wonder Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Why is this so hard to understand? Why do so many think Jesus was telling the disciples to pray down Pentecost, as so many still attempt today? The disciples understood Pentecost means count 50. 
This was no mystery to them. They knew their last meeting with Jesus had occurred 40 days into the 50-day period preceding Pentecost. They could do the math, and no Pentecost would arrive in 10 days. There would have been no doubt when it would fully come, as it says, so all could be in one accord in one place, or about what would happen when it did. It would have been easy for the disciples to connect simple math with the statement in Luke 24, 49 to wait in Jerusalem. There are only four accounts in the book of Acts where baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit took place. None refer to waiting for the Spirit at a tarry meeting so the newly converted could speak in tongues. Nowhere does the Bible authorize, instruct, suggest, or even hint that anyone should participate in these unscriptural meetings in order to receive or be baptized by the Holy Spirit. In fact, the term tarry meeting or anything similar is nowhere found in Scripture. The Bible contains only one verse explaining what some call baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have read it, but let's review. Paul wrote, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. No other verse mentions this phrase. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 and Colossians 1, 18 define body as the church. The body of Christ, the true church, is one unified body organization. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 merely says that God's Spirit baptizes people into the church, since the Greek word for baptize, baptizo, means to immerse, plunge into. It is easy to see that people are immersed or plunged into the Holy Spirit and into the church, as well as, of course, also into water. Recall from part one that Romans 8, 9 stated we certainly must have God's Spirit or we are none of Christ's. Understand, the term that Pentecostals use, baptism of the Holy Spirit, is simply not in the Bible. Like the term Terry meeting, it is a twisted version of a scriptural phrase done to alter what God intended. Pentecostal people make a giant assumption in regard to what they call baptism of the Holy Spirit. Without the slightest proof, they assert this is a kind of second receiving of the Holy Spirit, which takes place at a Terry meeting. Now, they do not actually teach that the Holy Spirit is given a second time, but rather that this second occurrence is when one receives power, generally described as given to witness for Jesus. Millions seek what they call the baptism. Supposedly, this is an additional necessary experience above conversion, and when it does not happen for some, they become hopeless and give up on the idea of Christianity. The following generally describes the, quote, manifestations that the, quote, seeker would hope to demonstrate. First, the tongue begins to loosen, almost like one is becoming drunken. Second are physical sensations and thrills, usually bringing certain gyrations, and even jumping, leaping, dancing, swaying, and shouting in a way thought to evidence receiving power never before felt. Third, a glibness and quickness or looseness of speech, best described as flippancy, is present, and all inhibition disappears. Of course, none of the apostles did any of these things, and God does not prescribe them in the Bible. I teach you the truth. Acts 2 and verse 4 states that those present were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is clearly the same as being baptized with it. When thousands around Jerusalem came running to the event and were baptized, it was only a result of hearing the words, Repent and be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This was the way they received the Holy Spirit. This event allowed them to be converted and added to the church. Every converted person, those who have repented and been baptized in water, has also been baptized by God's Spirit. The Bible teaches no later follow-up requirement for the newly converted to receive power. At the point when one is led by God's Spirit, he has become a begotten child of God and has the spirit of power. However, he is not yet born because that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
The newly begotten is a babe in Christ called to spend his life growing and overcoming. The disciples had not received God's Spirit prior to Acts 2. That account was not a description of a second follow-up baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was a description of how they and 3,000 others received the Holy Spirit and power for the first and only time in their lives. The Bible is God's basic instruction book on all matters pertaining to the Christian's life. Of course, it does teach that there is a correct, proper, and scriptural gift of tongues. God would not give the true gift of tongues without explaining how it was to be used. Those in Acts 19 and Cornelius' household did in fact speak in tongues. Again, 1 Corinthians 12 does list it as one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. What then does the Bible teach about the proper use of this gift? 1 Corinthians 14 has been called the tongues chapter. It is entirely about this subject. The Corinthians had become obsessed with receiving this gift. Many problems had ensued and the church was in confusion. Paul admonished, be not children in understanding. The brethren in Corinth were acting like children. Paul was forced to address the whole church. Since the chapter is 40 verses long, he obviously had much to say. We cannot review every word and phrase of such a long instruction, but we can examine the most critical points for understanding. It will become obvious that none of the modern Pentecostal groups practice what God taught the church through Paul. God wants his people to be of sound mind on this matter. Read 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. Bear in mind 1 Corinthians 14 builds on chapter 12, which introduces both the gift of tongues and interpretation, and on chapter 13, which explains why love is the most important gift. Now let's examine certain verses or phrases of 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 1, follow after charity or love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy inspired preaching. Paul urges the Corinthians to seek two gifts, neither of which is tongues or interpreting. Verses 4 and 5. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. I would that you all spoke with tongues. I wish that you all spoke with tongues, but more rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Obviously, Paul is not saying he's against tongues, but is explaining that prophesying edifies the church. Tongues does not unless there is an interpreter. Pentecostal meetings are chaotic, filled with confusion, with little or no interpreting occurring, and this is done incorrectly. Also notice that anyone who speaks in tongues only edifies himself, Paul said, when no interpreter is present. Herein lies the danger that millions ignore. It is easy to focus on the self, self-thrills, feelings and pleasures, and blessings for self. Now verse 6. If I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by, get this, revelation, or by knowledge, or prophesying, or doctrine? Tongues is useless if it does not bring one of these four things that Paul lists. Speaking gibberish reflects none of these. Verse 7 uses the phrase, except they give a distinction in the sounds when describing different musical instruments that must be played properly to be appreciated. Verses 8 to 11 expand on the principle that sounds must have meaning to those who hear them. In verse 12, Paul compliments Corinth for being zealous, but admonishes they should be so to the edifying of the church. Verse 13, let him that speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret this verse is plain, and yet it is ignored by Pentecostals. Verses 14 and 15 amplify the point and reflect verse 2, which explains that without an interpreter, those who speak in tongues speak not unto men but unto God. An interpreter is crucial. Verse 16, 
How shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at your giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what you say? Amen means so be it. Since tongues is a form of prayer, and prayers end with amen, without an interpreter no one can honestly say so be it to the message. In verses 17 and 18, Paul says that he spoke in tongues more than all the Corinthians, So he was obviously not against the gift, but rather against its misuse. Verse 19, Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. This powerful verse speaks for itself. Verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. This is vital. But what Pentecostal group understands it? They teach that tongues is the second experiencing of power to the believer, but tongues is called a sign to unbelievers, like the 3,000 in Jerusalem who were converted after witnessing this miracle. Verse 23, If the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, Paul adds, will they not say that you are mad or crazy? This is exactly what most would say upon walking into a modern Terry meeting. Seeing the confusion and disorder, reasonable people would say they're all crazy. Verses 24 and 25 explain that if the unbeliever saw and heard prophesying, again, inspired preaching, he could be benefited. In verse 26, Paul indicts the brethren for all speaking at the same time. This sets up the crucial verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, or one at a time, and let one interpret. Two critical points emerge. First, two or three is the limit for how many can speak in tongues, and this must be done one at a time. And second, there must also be an interpreter present, even for this small number. Do Terry meetings even come close to this? Of course not. Verse 28, But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. By now it is obvious that modern Pentecostals are in direct disobedience to this plain command. The chaotic confusion practiced today under the guise of speaking in tongues is not coming from the Holy Spirit. God gives His Spirit only to those who are obedient to His instruction and to His laws, all of them. Read Acts 5 verse 32. Verses 29 to 31 amplify verse 28. Now verse 32. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, meaning God's servants can control themselves. Both Proverbs 16.32 and 25.28 repeat this. If one's actions are out of control, he is not of God. So says God. Verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. This verse is all important and applies to everything Christian. Where confusion abounds, the true God is absent. But the God of this world, who is the author of confusion and deception, is present. Verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. This is a strong and unmistakable command. Why is it then that Pentecostal services are almost always dominated by women, when women are not to speak or preach during services at all? Ponder this. Verses 37 and 38. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. What could be plainer than this summary? While most will choose to remain ignorant, some will acknowledge and accept the commandments of the Lord on this matter. 
verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. This concludes the chapter and adds a capstone to the subject of interpreting and speaking in tongues. There is another aspect of tongues that must be understood. In 1 Corinthians 12, tongues is listed as a gift given within the body of Christ. This broadcast is only touched on what is Christ's body, and yet the gift of tongues is only given within that one spiritual body of believers. In fact, chapter 12 precedes the tongues chapter 14 and establishes the only foundation through which this gift can be properly understood and the only place it can be given. Therefore, one must understand what and also where is the body of Christ. Again, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 and Colossians 1, 18 reveal that the church Jesus built is called his body. So the body of Christ is the true church of God. It is a simple equation. This raises the question, where is the church of God? Jesus said, I will build my church. Notice he said church, singular, not churches. Wherever you find Christ's one church today, and again, tongues in the New Testament only occurs within his church, you find the only people who are even candidates to receive this or any other spiritual gift. In all other cases, tongues would be a counterfeit of Acts 2 given by the God of this world, Satan the devil. Therefore, to really understand this gift, the viewer must include in his studies locating the true church of God. This book, Where is the True Church and Its Incredible History, is unlike any other. You will be unable to put it down. I urge you to read it. Since true Christians are those called into the true church, it would behoove the viewer to answer the question, Am I being called? This is also carefully explained in this book. Like any other previous wrong teaching, some must unlearn their approach to tongues. They, and possibly you, must learn the truth about the tongues doctrine as surely as the truth about the Sabbath, salvation, God's law, the true gospel, or any other doctrine of God. I have pastored many thousands of people. Sadly, a few fell back into the alluring, pleasing sensations and thrills brought by the counterfeit tongues inspired of Satan. It was a virtual drug they could not kick. They neglected to continue trying the spirits, as we saw in part one, whether they are of God, and trusted feelings instead of God's plain word. Putting on the whole armor of God was too hard, and the sensations and pleasures they had given up too tempting. This booklet, Understanding Tongues, covers more than could just these two broadcasts. I urge you to also read it. Let's summarize. One simply cannot receive the gift of tongues outside the body of Christ. Jesus taught God's word is truth. You have just heard the truth about tongues, made unmistakably plain and understandable. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To learn more or to find a local congregation, contact us to receive a personal response from a minister.